Hi everybody, thank you for joining me as I rapidly lose patience with Timothy Keller's The Reason for God. We're over the halfway point now in this series. Uh, there are only three videos left, including this one. And in this video, I'm going to cover chapters 10 and 11 of The Reason for God. And let's get started with chapter 10, which is titled The Problem of Sin. Keller opens with two quotes from H.G. Wells. First, there's an optimistic one written prior to World War II, and then a more pessimistic one written after World War II. Keller follows these two quotes from H.G. Wells with this, quote, It is hard to avoid the conclusion that there is something fundamentally wrong with the world. What he means is, there is something wrong with us. The world is what it is. When we judge things like violence and war and poverty to be bad, what we're actually doing, whether Keller realizes it or admits it or not, is we're judging our own behavior and we're judging natural events according to our standards and against our own interests and our own desires. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the world. It also doesn't mean as Keller is going to argue in this chapter, that we are a race of fallen people. What it means is we're people who sometimes act selfishly and self-destructively and who create these lofty, stirring ideals and then fail to live up to them. In other words, it means we're human. And that's not an excuse for all the horrible things we do, but that's just an observation. We're human. That's a fact. Keller begins talking about sin and human hope. The Christian doctrine of sin is not as bleak and pessimistic as many non-Christians think, Keller says. It is actually a good thing that we are sinners, Keller argues, because as sinners we can be saved. We are not merely helpless victims of our psychology and our society. Properly understood, the Christian doctrine of sin can be a great source of hope. Well, there's that notion that we just need to properly understand what Christianity actually teaches. Keller has made this point multiple times in the book so far. It's not that, Christian, it's not that Christianity is doing anything wrong or bad. It's just that you just need to properly understand what the Christian teaching is. Luckily for us, Timothy Keller is one of the Christians who has a proper understanding, and he can set us straight. I'm so glad that he is not one of the many, many, many other Christians, never mind the non-Christians, with, uh, with improper understandings of all these very complex issues. Um, but then again, uh, <laughs> what am I thinking? We're not supposed to think of Christians in those sorts of terms as more Christian or less Christian or more correct. Or, I mean, we're not supposed to think of them on that continuum, are we? Timothy Keller says so. Also, the choice that we are faced with isn't accept that you are a sinner, as defined by Timothy Keller-type Christians, or live your life as a helpless victim of psychology and society. People who have suffered through their own bad choices and or circumstances beyond their control can get help that doesn't require them to rely on the doctrine of Keller's church or any other church. Anyway... Keller quotes Soren Kierkegaard in order to define sin as being despair in not wanting to be oneself before God. And Keller adds to this, quote, Sin is seeking to become oneself, to get an identity apart from God. Understood this way, sin is not merely breaking the rules that God has made. Sin is anything other than living with God as the center of your life, the thing you love more than anything else, and the thing on which you base your identity. Oh, is that all? Okay, well, uh, are you sure that there's nothing else I can do for you while I'm at it there, God? Keller says, quote, so, according to the Bible, the primary way to define sin is not just the doing of bad things, but the making of good things into ultimate things. It is seeking to establish a sense of self by making something else more central to your significance, purpose, and happiness than your relationship with God. 
And since Keller reckons God to be the ultimate everything, putting something ahead of God, whatever it is, means that you're making it into an ultimate thing. There's that obsession with the concept of ultimateness again. Never mind that I, as an individual who is only capable of attaching subjective value to things based on my subjective tastes and experiences, cannot grant true ultimate status to anything. Never mind that. Isn't it telling how Keller doesn't attempt to show why this particular biblical teaching is correct? It's enough for him to say that this is what the Bible says and no further justification is necessary. Just in case you don't get it, Keller offers a couple of illustrations of people who put things other than God as the center of their lives. He says, quote, In the movie Rocky, the title character's girlfriend asks him why it is so important for him to go the distance in the boxing match. Then I'll know I'm not a bum, he replies. In the movie Chariots of Fire, one of the main characters explains why he works so hard at running the 100-yard dash for the Olympics. He says that when each race begins, quote, I have 10 lonely seconds to justify my existence. Both of these men looked to athletic achievement as the defining force that gave meaning to their lives. Are you dedicating your life to something that's important to you? Well, you be sure to say hi to Harold Abrams when you get to hell! So what's so bad about uh, building an identity on something other than God, anyway? Well, Keller argues that identities based on non-God things are inherently unstable. Quote, For example, if I build my identity on being a good parent, I have no true self. I am just a parent, nothing more. If something goes wrong with my children or my parenting, there is no me left. What the fuck? Does anyone else's life work this way? Does this sound like the life of anyone else watching this video? My brother and I were fortunate to have two dedicated parents and two dedicated grandparents, my paternal ones. Uh, they looked out for us when we were kids. They raised us. They grew us up into proper young men, hopefully, theoretically. But at no time was any of them just a parent or just a grandparent. My mother devoted years of her life to raising us. She also worked, had friends, had a husband, had her own parents and brothers and sisters, went places, did things, read books, watched movies, you know, lived. It is idiotically simplistic to suggest that our lives can be reduced, not just can be, but must be reduced to one particular passion or role, and that if something goes wrong with that, our sense of self just disappears. Keller continues, If anything threatens your identity, you will not just be anxious, but paralyzed with fear. If you lose your identity through the failings of someone else, you will not just be resentful, but locked into bitterness. If you lose it through your own failings, you will hate or despise yourself as a failure as long as you live. And you'll stay that way forever. You know, he speaks with such assurance, such authority. He sounds so much more like a psychologist than like a Christian minister. I'm just kidding, he sounds exactly like a Christian minister. If your level of psychological insight is somewhere below that of Dr. Phil, you should probably shut the fuck up about it. Keller shares more of his expertise, his, his evident expertise in this area with us. Quote, An identity not based on God also leads inevitably to deep forms of addiction. When we turn good things into ultimate things, we are, as it were, spiritually addicted. If we take our meaning in life from our family, our work, a cause, or some achievement other than God, they enslave us. And God would never do that. Consider how presumptuous and condescending this is. If you derive meaning in your life, or a sense of purpose, or a sense of self, 
from anything other than not just God, but the particular God Timothy Keller believes in, the right God, you are doomed inevitably to deep addiction. And even Keller seems to realize how ridiculous that statement is, so he walks it back a bit in the next sentence and invents this bullshit concept of spiritual addiction. Oh, you'll be spiritually addicted to that stuff. If you derive meaning from anything other than the God of the Bible, your family, your work, a cause you believe in, a goal you're pursuing, anything, you can't possibly have a meaningful, fulfilling life. Keller isn't just saying that it will be more difficult for you to have a fulfilling life. He's saying it will be impossible. If you're an atheist, or perhaps just a non-Christian, since you might be a theist but dedicating your life to the wrong God, your life is meaningless and you are unfulfilled. You might as well get used to it. That's the way it is. Timothy Keller says so. Remember how likable Keller seemed in the first few chapters of this book when he was talking about how Christians should accept that the church has historically been responsible for great evil and suffering and that modern Christians should be dedicated to social justice and helping the less fortunate? What happened to that guy? Why are we now stuck with this insufferable asshole? Keller turns from how shitty your life as an individual is without God to how shitty our society is without God. Sin, Keller says, citing Jonathan Edwards, and that's sinners in the hands of an angry God, Jonathan Edwards, sin destroys the fabric of society. Keller says, quote, if our highest goal in life is the good of our family, then, says Edwards, we will tend to care less for other families. If our highest goal is the good of our nation, tribe, or race, then we will tend to be racist or nationalistic. If our ultimate goal in life is our own individual happiness, then we will put our own economic and power interests ahead of those of others. Isn't it nice that Christianity insulates people from all of those things? And if our ultimate purpose is our God, we will tend to devalue those who worship another god. Again, the only solution to any of these problems Keller can offer, implicitly or explicitly, is converting to his version of Christianity. He's got it right, people who are doing something else have it wrong, and should switch to doing his thing. No justification for any of this, just assertion on top of assertion. Keller moves on to the cosmic consequences of sin. Keller writes that sin destroyed the perfect harmony that existed in nature prior to the fall of man. God delighted in the world he'd made, and then we broke it. Quote, disease, genetic disorders, famine, natural disasters, aging, and death itself are as much the result of sin as are oppression, war, crime, and violence. Thanks for playing, Tim. Good effort, but it's hard to build a bridge from Christianity can be a modern, rational, socially conscious, scientifically defensible ideology to sin-caused disease and death. Those are the beliefs of people who live in fucking caves. And I have nothing against people who live in caves or the stupid shit that they believe. They live in caves after all. How are they going to know any better? But Timothy Keller, what is your excuse? Keller closes chapter 10 by cautioning that if we don't live for Jesus, we will live for something else. And eventually, that something else, whatever it is, will let you down. Jesus is the only thing to which you can devote your life that will fill you up and never let you down. Those weren't Keller's exact words. I just paraphrased because I felt like making Jesus sound like a Bud Light. The only way Jesus will never let you down is if you accept him, or rather what other people are telling you about him, blindly with an unshakable dogmatic faith. Because if you devote your life to Jesus, but you're open to questions and doubt and skepticism, and ra rationality and science and all sorts of other inconvenient things. And you find out at some point down the road that the Jesus you've chosen as Lord is a myth. 
And whether there was a historical basis for Jesus or not, we have no reason to assume that the Jesus we read about in the New Testament is anything other than a myth. You will be let down, and you will be unfulfilled by Jesus, just the same as you would be potentially by anything else. Here again, Keller is attempting to exempt Christians from a problem that we all have to deal with, that is just a part of the human condition. There is always the chance that you will be disappointed, that you will fail, that you will suffer some horrible tragedy, that your foundations will be shaken. Hopefully, that won't happen to you, and hopefully, if it does happen to you, you'll survive, and you'll be able to pick up and move on. But you might not. There's no way around it. There is no such thing as the foolproof plan for a fulfilling, meaningful life. There is nothing you can build your life around or pin your hopes to that is guaranteed not to ever let you down. It doesn't exist. It's an uncertainty that we all have to deal with. And I'd rather face it, accept the possibility, and live my life as best I can. Pretending that the rules just don't apply to me is foolish. Moving on to chapter 11, Religion and the Gospel. So let's just say, for the sake of getting on with it, that we accept the premise that the main problem with the world and with us is sin. What are we supposed to do about it? What's the solution? Well, Keller says, quote, Even if you accept the Christian diagnosis of the problem, there doesn't seem to be any particular reason why one must look only to Christianity for the solution. You may say, fine, I understand that if you build your identity on anything but God, it leads to breakdown. Why must the solution be Jesus and Christianity? Why can't some other religion do as well, or just my own personal faith in God? Before we get further into this chapter, I just want to draw your attention to how disingenuously Keller has framed his argument. We're not dealing just with the Christian diagnosis of a problem. We're dealing with a problem that, unless we accept Christian doctrine as true, we have no reason to think even exists. That concept of sin being the ultimate source of the problems in the world and of sin being defined as building your life around anything other than God is Christian in nature. You can't look at the world or at human nature from a logical, scientific viewpoint and conclude that the flaw in the whole operation is our broken relationship with Timothy Keller's God. That very concept comes from the Bible. So, not just the diagnosis, but the treatment and the underlying condition itself are inventions of Christianity, and it's just false to claim otherwise. The difference between other religions and Christianity, Keller says, is the difference between religion and gospel. At least he's creative enough not to say religion and relationship. Maybe like half a point for that. Though he admits that Christianity can be called a religion, unlike other religions, it doesn't teach that you can be saved through your own moral effort. Instead, it teaches the gospel of salvation through grace. Keller stresses that it is not enough, even in theory, to live a good enough life to attain salvation without calling upon Christ. There are two forms of sin, doing bad things and doing good things and becoming self-righteous as a result, because only God is allowed to be self-righteous. And boy, does he take advantage of that. Uh, Jesus must not be merely your teacher or your role model, but your savior. Anything else is a rejection of the gospel. Keller says, quote, Self-salvation through good works may produce a great deal of moral behavior in your life, but inside you are filled with self-righteousness, cruelty, and bigotry, and you are miserable. You are always comparing yourself to other people, and you are never sure you are being good enough. <sighs> Project much? Jesus Christ. I understand that we've all got shit to work through, and believe me, I'm sympathetic, but don't put your shit on other people. 
don't assume that other people who do good for its own sake rather than to glorify the God they believe to be compelling them to do it in the first place are secretly bitter and cruel and miserable. I mean, I can just tell you from my own experience, when I perform a kindness for another person, I feel good. I feel happy. I feel useful. There are times, of course, when I get a little too full of myself, but I think I've got a lid on that for the most part, uh, at least when it comes to how I treat other people. I don't think I'm cruel or bigoted, and I'm certainly not miserable. And if I were miserable, I doubt it would be because of all the good moral things I'm doing. Is that what you're feeling, Tim? Is that how you see your life without your faith in God? Because if so, you should probably see a professional about that. Just a suggestion. Keller goes on. You cannot, therefore, deal with your hideousness and self-absorption through the moral law by trying to be a good person through an act of will. You need a complete transformation of the very motives of your heart. Tell me more about my hideousness, guy who wrote that paragraph. And to clarify, you should see a mental health professional, not a fellow professional bullshitter. Keller describes the damage done by what he calls Pharisaic religion, that is, the religion of people who try to save themselves rather than turning to God for salvation, referring, of course, to the Pharisees, the self-righteously religious uh, establishment of the New Testament. Since without God we can never achieve what is necessary to have a sense of true worth or purpose, we are doomed to constant struggle and disappointment. This leaves us feeling anxiety, insecurity, and anger, which in turn leads us to treat other people poorly, to oppress and marginalize and exclude others. Keller says, quote, Despite all their legal righteousness, then, Pharisees have lives that are, if anything, more driven by the despair of sin. If we accept this description of the motivations and feelings of people who try to be good people for reasons other than serving Timothy Keller's God, along with Keller's pejorative description of these people as Pharisees, that is, and there is not one single reason why we should. So Pharisees, and pretty much everyone who isn't Timothy Keller's kind of Christian is a Pharisee, apparently. Uh, they have horrible lives, and everything bad in our society is their fault. But how do we fix it? Well, we stop putting our hopes in religion, and we start putting them in the gospel. Keller says, quote, The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and sniveling. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I do not think more of myself nor less of myself. Nor, nor less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. And we've seen those qualities in action in these last two chapters, haven't we? I find that when Keller declares in the most absolute terms that everyone outside of his particular version of Christianity is miserable and self-righteous and incapable of true happiness or fulfillment and doomed to live meaningless lives, those passages just radiate humility. Speaking of humility and not feeling superior to anyone, here's another reason why true Christians like Keller are superior to other people. Quote, Religion and the gospel also differ fundamentally in how they treat the other, those who do not share one's own beliefs and practices. A Christian's worth and value are not created by excluding anyone, but through the Lord who was excluded for me. So if I've deciphered this mindless Christian happy talk correctly, Keller is saying that Christians don't define themselves by defining and devaluing outgroups, which means 
that when they work to oppress others by imposing their values and standards on society as a whole through force of law, by denying civil marriage or child adoption to same-sex couples, for example, at least we can take some comfort in knowing that those Christians aren't defining themselves by it. Keller says, quote, This means I cannot despise those who do not believe as I do. Luckily, I can still treat them as though I despise them by advocating that they be denied basic rights and privileges which I would never accept being denied myself. Keller goes on, quote, Since I am not saved by my correct doctrine or practice, then this person before me, even with his or her wrong beliefs, might be morally superior to me in many ways. I'd say that's a very strong possibility at this point. Keller addresses the argument that this is all too easy, that all you have to do is give your life to Christ, get yourself saved, and then you can do whatever you want. Eh, not so fast. No one who is actually experienced in the receiving of God's wonderful ultimate saving grace would ever speak that way, Keller says. And that, children, is what's known as a no-true-Scotsman fallacy. Keller finishes off the chapter by stressing the distinction between the gospel and religion. Christianity, he says, differs fundamentally from other religions. The founders of other religions came as teachers. Jesus, on the other hand, came as a savior. We are not saved by our own doing, but by Christ's doing. Because of this, Christianity is not a religion, but it is also not not a religion. It is, Keller concludes, something else entirely. Mm. I don't know about that. Let's 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 see here. Doctrines based on incredible but unsubstantiated claims, unjustified assertions, and appeals to authority. Check. Disparagement of those who hold contrary beliefs. Well, it's mostly passive-aggressive, but it's definitely there. Check. Sweeping, incredibly confident judgments being made about subjects one clearly knows little or nothing about. Major check. Displaying astounding levels of arrogance, presumption, and condescension, yet describing oneself as humble and selfless. Biggest check ever. Yeah, it sounds like religion to me. That's it for this video. That's it for chapters 10 and 11. I will be back in the next video in this series to cover the next two chapters of the book. Chapter 12, The True Story of the Cross, and Chapter 13, The Reality of the Resurrection. It sounds like it's just going to keep getting better from here. Um, I will try to keep the snark under control, but it's very difficult. when we uh, This book. This book. Um... Thank you guys so much for watching this. Thank you for being interested. I hope that it continues to be of, of, of interest and of use to you. Please feel free, as always, to leave comments. Tell me where I, where I got something right, where I got something wrong. Agree, disagree, argue, support, whatever. Be you atheist, theist, or anything, any, any color of the ideological rainbow. Uh, I enjoy reading anything you have to say. So thank you so, so much for watching. And I will see you back here in the next video.